Vivek Ramaswamy, Republican presidential candidate, thank you for joining Scripps News. It's good to be here. Well, I want to start with just a little bit about you. We are at sure. a bar in Manchester. This is the type of stuff that you've been doing for a number of months now in this state, in Iowa. You've seen some positive movement in the polls. But before we get to that, I just want to know, 37 years old, a biotech entrepreneur who decided not only to get into politics, but to run for the highest office in the land. What made you run for president? So look, I've lived the American dream. My parents came to this country with almost no money. I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies that develop life-saving medicines. Another that competes against firms like BlackRock and other large financial institutions. And I did it while getting married, having two kids, following my faith. To me, that's the American dream. And I worry that that American dream isn't gonna exist for the next generation. I think for a long time, we conservatives have been running from something. Now's our moment to start running to something, to our vision of what it means to be American. And as the first millennial to ever run for the nomination for president as a Republican, I think it is my responsibility to reach that next generation. That's why I'm in this race. I was surprised to hear that you had not voted until 2020, until the 2020 presidential election. So you voted for the first time. Yep. Now it's a little bit over two years. You're running for president. That's a pretty big jump to just go from voting now two and a half years later uh, to run. I mean, the reality is most young people in this country don't vote because they're not excited by the candidates that they see. And in my 20s, I was much the same way. Something changed for me when I became a father in 2020. That's when my first son was born. It just changed my perspective to say that I'm not just going to passively sit aside and just because I'm not excited by other candidates, I'm not going to be engaged. I stepped down from my job as a biotech CEO. I started writing extensively. I wrote three books in the last two years as well. So that's also not something that usually happens over a two-year period. But I've become obsessed with reviving our national identity because if I was to go back and do it again, absolutely, I would want to be more engaged in my 20s as a citizen. But I also think I have the best understanding of how to reach that next generation. And frankly, we're already doing it in this campaign. Most of our supporters are young people. Most of our donors are first time ever donors. 30% of them, first time they've ever donated to a Republican was their donation to me. Normally that's 2% in a campaign. So in many ways, it's my responsibility. I feel that responsibility to reach young Americans because I know what it's like to be in their shoes. Yeah. In many ways, I still am. One of the uh, proposals that you put forth that has gotten the most attention is adding certain prerequisites for young people to vote for the under 25 crowd. You know, that's a group that, as you kind of are uh, proof of, is not as engaged as their yes. older generation. So why do you think it's important for young people, whether it is to take the citizenship test or to have some form of service, why do you think that they need an extra step in order to be able to vote? I think, and I can say this, this is first personal for me. Young people don't value something they passively inherit. We value something we have a stake in building in knowing something about. Voting rates are rock bottom for people of age 18 to 25. Personally, I think every 18 year old should have to pass the same test that an immigrant has to pass in order to become a citizen of this country. And you know what? If I had been asked to pass that test, absolutely I would have done it and absolutely I would have voted. So I think voting rates will skyrocket in this country amongst young people after we actually make it mean something. But right now, everyone's just going through the motions. We have to fill that hunger for purpose and meaning with the vision of what it actually means to be a citizen of this country. That's what I'm looking to deliver. I think some people watching are gonna hear that and think, well, young people also tend to vote democratically, at least in the past few the elections. The very few that vote do. Yes, That's right. Is, does that have anything to do with this proposal? No, actually. I happen to be running as a Republican, but I just, I told the audience upstairs the same thing. I could care less for partisan distinctions between Republican and Democrat. What I care about is whether or not we are pro-American. Do we stand for the ideals that this country was founded on? Do we believe in those ideals? Or do we wish to apologize for a nation founded on those ideals? That's the real distinction in American politics today. And I stand on the pro-American side much more than I do on some Republican or Democrat side. And now you talk a lot about being the first Republican millennial to be running. Of course, yeah. we had a couple millennials on the Democratic side last yeah. time. But it's interesting, a lot of your policies don't necessarily line up where millennial politics are. I'm thinking about 
you know, Harvard Youth Survey, which was out this spring, 63%, and this is the 18 to 29% crowd, want stricter gun laws. About half of the country, half of those younger people want uh, more regulation on climate producing, coal producing uh, companies, even if it comes at the expense of the economy. And so I'm interested just kind of how your generation has, uh, being a 37 going on 38 year old, how has that influenced your politics, because it seems to be different than where a lot of people your age are right now. I think it's less about policy and more about style. My style is authenticity, open book, I show up. We go to college campuses across the country, including in New Hampshire where we are today. I'll talk to the far left, the far right, it doesn't matter. We show up, and so I believe in free speech and open debate. When I have a protester at my event last night, we bring her to the front and give her a microphone rather than kicking them out. And so I think that as, as it relates to young people, one of the things I'm seeing is that many young people don't yet know what they believe. They, I know how they fill out a survey, but many young people are hungry for purpose and direction and meaning and identity. And the left has been very good at filling that vision with values and visions like race and gender and sexuality and climate change. I'm offering a different vision, individual, family, nation, God. And I, what I'm seeing across this country is there's an openness to an actual affirmative vision. Yes, a lot of Republicans have too long just been criticizing the hypocrisies of the other side. That doesn't inspire young people. But if we say, this is our own vision, this is what we actually stand for. Now I think we're engaging people, and then especially to say that you don't have to agree with 100% of what I say. But if you know that I mean what I say 100% of the time, now I think we're actually making progress. I want to talk a little bit about what you did before you entered politics. I was being sure. a biotech entrepreneur. You talked about it at the campaign event just a little bit ago. One of your most high profile companies was, what was it, Axivant? And that was the biggest IPO for a biotech ever back in 2015. It was based in Bermuda, and I'm interested in why. Oh, so the company I built was Royvent. Yeah. There were many subsidiaries. The, the IP was actually housed for some of those companies outside the United States because that's what many investors across pharma, I don't care if you're Pfizer or Eli Lilly or whatever, in your corporate org charts, the US tax code is so darn broken that that's what you ultimately have to do to be able to maximize value for shareholders. The reality of my experience of building a biotech company, it was instrumental for preparing me for this journey that I'm on. That first drug that we developed, the first major drug certainly, was a drug for Alzheimer's disease that didn't work. That was a humbling experience for me but it also taught me the importance of taking a risk for something that you actually value. And that created the foundation for then developing five of the medicines that I worked on are FDA approved products today. One of them I talked about upstairs is probably the one I'm most proud of is a life-saving therapy in kids that would not have ever reached FDA approval but for the company that I founded. And so for me, when I say that I'm pro-life, for example, it means it in every sense of that word. And I think my experience as, a, as an executive of somebody who's built something up from scratch, I think is something that actually is an experience that we need as an outsider in running the federal government. If you are president, would you make it a priority to encourage U.S. companies to make sure that they are not incorporating overseas, maybe to get some of that tax dollars back? It's only to you what I would prioritize yeah. as U.S. president is making sure we have a rational tax code in this country. 12% flat tax across the board. And what we really need to incentivize is American jobs employment here in this country. I mean, I've, the companies I founded have collectively employed thousands of Americans. My parents came to this country as immigrants, actually both of us, my brother and I each founded companies that have helped and employed thousands of Americans collectively. That's what I think we need more of in this country is a lot of that manufacturing that's shifted to places like China, to Japan, to other parts of the world. I think it's a good thing for this country if we bring more of that manufacturing and more of that capacity back home and a lot of my policy uses pro-market approaches to actually accomplish that goal. Talking about a little bit about politics, you are having a moment, seeing a lot of good poll numbers, now in third in a number of surveys. It seems to be coming at you know, the expense of a lot of other candidates. One who is not going up is Ron DeSantis. What do you think that your campaign is doing that his is not? Well, I'm not gonna criticize somebody else's campaign, but I think one of the things that distinguishes me from much of the field in either party in this campaign is that we're actually offering a vision of our own. A lot of other candidates are anti-something, fill in the blank, anti-X. I'm not anti-something, I'm pro-American. 
And I think that's something that's different. I also think that there is a hunger in the Republican Party for a true outsider. And part of being a true outsider isn't just that you haven't worked in government, and I haven't. It's also somebody who isn't beholden to the donor class in the Republican Party. The fact of the matter is most professional politicians in the GOP listen to what their donor masters tell them to say. In my case, I've invested over $15 million already of my hard-earned money into this campaign precisely because I don't want to be beholden to anybody. And I think our base is starting to value that. I know you've hit the fundraising goal to make that first debate. Uh, we have the second quarter fundraising numbers yeah. are going to be coming out publicly. What will yours look like? We've hit over, as of the time we're having this conversation, over 65,000 small dollar donors. 40,000 unique donors for that first debate. We're at over 65,000. And the unique thing about me is I've never had a political donor. We had no donor lists to start with. So if I can shatter that record, I think that 40,000 is, is good for anybody else. And, and as I said, I've put over 15 million into the campaign already. We've begun to raise millions of dollars from the outside, from the small dollar donors across this country. We haven't even done that many formal fundraisers yet. As we head into the fall, we'll do more formal fundraisers as well. But I'm focused more on the message and the grassroots movement, the money we expect to follow. You've also introduced probably the first of its kind uh, program in terms of giving people 10% of commission essentially on raising money for you. Was that born out of concern that you might not reach those higher fundraising thresholds that we expect from the Republican? Uh, to the contrary, yeah. actually. We've actually been crushing our fundraising targets. I mean, there are even many established governors, senators struggling to regenerate the kind of donor base that we've generated starting from scratch. What motivated me was I just dismantled bureaucracy. I mean, that's my whole career. I dismantled bureaucracy in big pharma. I took on the bureaucracy of the ESG industrial complex. I'm on my way to d disrupt a bureaucracy in the federal government. But there's a bureaucracy in the middle, which is the political consultant class, the managerial class of political fundraising, where there's a small cloistered oligopoly that they just, they already do it. They take 10%. It's just a small group of people who are raising money from supposedly donors in cloistered corridors of Palm Beach or Silicon Valley. I said, if they're doing it, we might as well democratize that and make that available to everybody. One of your competitors, Doug Bergman, is offering people $20 gift cards to donate $1 to the campaign. What's your reaction to that? I think that there are a number of other candidates that are, frankly, thinking through how they're going to manage to meet the 40,000 unique donor threshold to make that first debate. So I think a lot of people are trying different strategies and seeing what works. The good news for us is we've already crossed 65,000, and that number is just accelerating by the day. That first debate, what does it say about Donald Trump if he does not show up? You know what, I'm not focused on who shows up or not. I'm gonna be there. I think that I don't really, I don't think it much matters in the early debates whether he shows up. I expect by the end of this process, though, he and I will be on that debate stage together. But the early few debates, I don't think it much matters. Earlier today, Chris Christie said he would be a coward if he didn't show up. You don't agree with that? I reject the vengeance and grievance campaign. I mean, like I said, a lot of other people in this race Chris Christie seems to be in this race for one reason, to throw bullets at a different arrow, throw, throw arrows at a different candidate. I could care less to play that game. My goal is, what does it mean to be an American? Let's revive that national identity. What are we running to? We're not running from something, we're running to something as Americans. And you know, my understanding was Chris Christie was doing debate prep with Donald Trump in 2020 after his first term. So I don't know what's going on between those two guys. I could care less. I'm focused more on the country. Yeah. And I want to end with a question about your faith. Uh, yes. You know, most U.S. presidents have been Christian. You are a practicing Hindu. Do you feel like the country is ready for a practicing Hindu to be president? I think the country is ready for a president who's going to lead us to revive our national identity, regardless of what faith that president subscribes to, as long as it's somebody who believes in God. I believe we are a nation under God. I think a belief in a God that is something more than just us being atomistic individuals here. I think that's important. That's a faith that I share. And you know what? I'm not Christian, but I do share the same Judeo-Christian values that this country was founded on. Sacrifice, duty, speaking truth, the foundation of family. I don't just preach these ideals to check a box. Look at the way I live my life. We live according to the values that this nation was founded on. And even to evangelical Christian or broad Christian audiences across this country. I think that's more important. How we share those values and how authentically we share those values is more important than the, you know, whether or not we check the box of a particular faith on a government form that we fill out. 
Vivek Ramaswamy, thank you so much to say thank you. on the campaign trail. All I right. appreciate that.